Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is in Luke 3, Jesus' Submission. Are you familiar with uh, Carrie Underwood's song, uh, Jesus Take the Wheel? Amen. It's a pretty good song compared to a lot of other songs, I can assure you that. I, I will say, and I do like the song, and I don't mind listening to it, and I don't mind those who are here to it and all that stuff. I'm not trying to talk you out of it. But I do have a fundamental problem with what that song teaches. And of course, I'm all about surrendering to Jesus and Jesus controlling your life and steering your life and all that. But here's my fundamental problem. What, what made us ever think that we ever had the steering wheel? I have a fundamental problem there, but I just want to back up and say, wait a minute, how can I give Jesus the wheel when, as best I can tell, we never had it? Never will. Jesus, take the wheel. What, what makes you think you're ever in the front seat to begin with? Come on. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have only ever been in the front seat of the universe, and they're not giving that one up. You can be sure of that. Fundamental problem with it, again, like I said, I'm not against the surrendering your whole life and everything, but I think we need to back up and say, wait a minute, I've never been in control, nor will I ever be. The closest we've ever been to the steering wheel is the back seat. And some of our problems here today is because we're trying to run things from the back seat. It doesn't work very well. Try to find some graphics of people. You run it from the back seat. You're that lady right there in the star dress. <laughs> or, or this one as well, you know. The Lord trying to drive and you're yelling in his ear about how he's making bad decisions. Doesn't know what he's doing. Is that the implications that you know you're fussing and pushing against the will of God in your life as he leads? Because somehow you've got this false idea that you're in control and that somehow when you want to, you'll let Jesus take the wheel. You're never in the front seat to begin with. Not ever. Here, here's a better country and western song, which I cannot endorse because the rest of it's no good, but I do like the title. Instead of Jesus take the wheel, how about this one, country and western? It is a legitimate country and western song. Get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. That's actually better theology. It really is. And in fact, if we could get that one through our heads, that's really the way it works. God's running this thing, and, and as you sit in the back seat, your only comments ought to be, well, that's a great idea, God, since you came up with it. I wouldn't have turned down that road, God, but you know what? You're God. You can do whatever you want to, and I know you never make bad decisions, so I'm, I'm just trusting you one more time, and I'll never see Jesus take the wheel ever again because I know I don't sit in that front seat, and I'm just glad that you're up there, God, and you're in control, and I'm believing you, and that whole attitude in a, in a strange way, maybe a surprising way, is the attitude and actions of a very interesting character in history. His name was Jesus. You notice, uh, back to Jesus take the wheel, there was a time in which Jesus has always been, by the way, with the Father and the Holy Spirit behind the wheel. But there was a time in history for 33 years that Jesus took a back seat. Jesus took a back seat. And that might seem strange to you, but I'm going to show it to you this morning and how he set an example of how we're supposed to ride in the position where we are in the back seat. Jesus set that example for us by taking a back seat to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. But let's, let's first of all look at our jumping off place here in Luke chapter 3. Verse 21, we talked about last time about baptism and saw how Jesus was baptized and the reason why he was baptized. And here, just adding to that, just the imagery of how God points at him and says, this is my son. It says, now it came about when the people were baptized that Jesus also was baptized and he, while was praying, heaven was opened. So here he is in this humbled place, having been baptized like other sinners, even though himself not. And the heavens open, it says, and watch what happens. The Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And don't think the Holy Spirit looks like a dove, because another place, just not very far, he starts looking like fire. So is it fire, or is it a dove, or is it, can he be anything he wants to be? And that, I think, is the correct answer. Any way he appears in physical form, he can just simply do that. But don't, he's not physical, obviously he's spirit. In bodily form, like a dove, so it wasn't a dove, a voice came out of heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. And when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being supposedly the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. And some point to this event, and they say, and, and let me just say this from the beginning, it is rank heresy to say this. It, it may seem benign, but it is definitely not. 
They say that at this point, that's when Jesus became the Son of God. He wasn't the Son of God until he was 30, and he became the Son of God when the dove descended. And yeah, some of you are shaking your heads because you know that, that it smells to high heaven. It's not just rank heresy, it's not just a mistake, it's, also, it's very demonic. Because it leads to some seriously bad conclusions. So if, here's, here's the full, full orb idea of that messed up thinking. And by the way, those who adhere to this include the Mormons, J, JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, to a certain degree, the Muslims, uh, and a lot of others. Uh, we just say at all. They, they all have a, a wrong idea, a demonically inspired idea. Demons, are, they're inspired all right, but they're demonically inspired. Be very careful. People read the scriptures and get inspired by the wrong spirit. Watch it. These guys uh, headed in the wrong direction uh, way back there. But they believe that, the, so they say supposedly, that this is the first time the Spirit of God came upon Jesus and that he remained upon Jesus' his entire ministry. That's how he did all his miracles. And that he removed himself from Jesus at the point of Jesus' death. That's why Jesus, they say, on the cross said, uh, you know, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And they say, oh, that's the time of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, that is not scriptural. It's, not, it's, it's a total demonic opinion of theirs. It's rank heresy and leads to all kinds of conclusions that are, that are bad. Here's the worst conclusion. So if he ceased to be the son of God before he died, that means he died as a regular old man, which means we're all going to hell. <laughs> I'm telling you, unless the son of God himself died on that cross as God himself, we cannot be saved. There is no man that can save you if he's only a man. But he was both man and fully God at the same time, at the point of his birth and death and resurrection. He, indeed, is the Savior. Jesus didn't begin to exist at some point in time. Not his conception or any other time. Jesus had always been co-equal, co-eternal with the Father of the same substance, with the Holy Spirit and the Father exclusively, an exclusive relation with him. He never ceased to have that relationship, not, not either before, nor during, nor after his uh, earthly ministry. Holy Spirit, in addition, never ceased to be anything other than completely involved with Jesus' life. All this is, if you read other places, is God pointing a finger at his son so that everybody else could know. It's not a time in which Jesus was anointed with special power or anything, no. He had always had, doesn't it say, as, the, as Mary says, how is it possible that a virgin can conceive? She said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That was all part of his birth. So from the birth, at least we can say the Holy Spirit was, was upon him. Uh, not just his birth, look at this, his death. Much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish. He didn't do it on his own. There's no absence of the Holy Spirit, not in his death, not in his resurrection. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ and Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Never separated from the spirit. Never anything in un, other than 100% in unison with the Father and with the Spirit throughout his entire ministry. Listen to the way John describes him here in figurative terms, the symbolism that he gives us here. I saw between the throne, the Father sitting on the throne with four living creatures in front of him surrounded by 24 elders. And a lamb was standing. Who's that? That would be Jesus, figuratively speaking. He is the lamb of God, as John describes him, the, the one who would come and take our place, a substitutionary death. Lamb standing as if slain, cut throat. Having seven heads and seven eyes, is that the way Jesus really is? Like I said, no, it's a symbolism. But what is that symbolism? It tells us immediately which are the seven or the sevenfold spirit, the full faceted spirit of God. He contains the whole nature in every way of what the spirit of God. And notice they're complete unison. It's not one separate entity from another. It, it affects in every way the description of who he is. It's all who he's always been. And it's who he will always be and never cease to be any of those things in his earthly ministry. Like I said, this stuff is rank heresy and I'm expecting way better out of you guys. But nonetheless, the spirit of God is the spirit of Christ. If anyone does not have the spirit, notice, of Christ, he does not belong to him. It's not something separate from him. It's one and the same with him. Uh, the spirit is not the... He's the spirit of Christ, not the spirit that made him Christ, which is that whole, like I said, rank um, uh, heresy uh, teaching that we briefly went over there. So the Holy Spirit's descent was no other, nothing otherwise than just simply to mark him publicly as God's son. That's all it was about. Not for Jesus' sake, not for the Father's sake, not for the Spirit's sake, but for John's sake 
And everyone's standing there saying, so they can say, listen, this guy's not the same guy. He's not another sinner to pass through the waters. This is none other than the Son of God himself. And his ministry starts off that way. But I want us to pay careful attention to the order here. So the Son is standing in the water in humility. The Father is speaking his will. Holy Spirit is demonstrating his power. This is a mark, if you will, of a motion of the entire ministry of Jesus. And I want us to flesh that out this morning, uh, and then we're going to be done. He, he was, listen, he was and always has had his own power. Isn't that right? Jesus. He's the Son of God. And what kind of power is that? Omnipotent, complete, total. He's got it all. He doesn't have a portion of it. He's got all of it. Because he shares completely uh, in complete unison with the other two uh, uh, people of the whole, persons of the Holy Spirit. He, he has his own power. He has his own knowledge. He's not only omnipotent, he's omniscient. He knows everything. Has his own prerogative. Always has. Always will. But hear me. There was a 30-year, 33-year period in which he did not. And it's not because it was taken from him, but because he gave it. Watch. Philippians 2, what was it like for the Son of God to become a man? Well, he became like one of us in every way. Do you have supernatural powers? You know, by the Spirit living in us, we can do a lot of things, but is it us doing it? No, there is no power as being human. There is power through the Spirit, but it is him, and all the credit goes to him, and it's his work as he desires, and he gifts, and he empowers his church to do whatever his church, whatever he has them doing. He's been doing this for for 2,000 years, but it's all about him. But Jesus has his own stuff, doesn't he? He never has to have to rely upon the Spirit because he himself is the Spirit. He himself is in unison with the Father, right? Well, he has all his own power, his own knowledge, his own prerogative, but there was a time that he set it aside. Watch. Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality of God a thing to be grasped, nothing to prove. He had nothing to prove about who he was. He was completely God in every way, complete unison. But for our sakes and for 33 years, notice, he emptied himself. He didn't cease to be God, but he set, his prerogative, set aside his prerogatives as God. And he became just like you. What are you limited to? Only be in one place at one time, right? With the exception of your wife, none of us know everything, do they? <laughs> Sorry. With the exception of your husband, no one knows everything, uh, do, do they? We don't know everything, we don't have everything, we can only be in one place. Jesus became like that for us. In order to do that, he had to set aside what he had always known, nothing to prove, nothing to gain, because he had it all. He set it aside for a period of time, it says there, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, relegated himself to sleep, to use in the bathroom. I know that's not a thought you want. To, to, to live in, in a poverty-stricken area, ministering to people, being, being tired, subject to illness. He, he, he set aside the prerogatives, not being God, but, but exercising the prerogatives of being deity. He didn't use his deity for a 33-year period. He set them aside, and listen to this. He took our place, which is where? If we're in a car, where do you sit? I already told you, the back seat. That's where he went. He left his eternal position, which has always been in the driver's seat, and he left it to the Father and the Spirit, and he took the same place where you sit and I sit eternally, which is in the back seat. Jesus took a back seat to the other two of the Trinity for the time period of his time here on earth. He did not cease to be God, but he set aside the use of his deity and submitted himself to the will of the Father and the power of the Spirit. That was his life here for 33 years. So he set aside the use of this deity for the time on earth. So how did he do those miracles? That's your next question, right? I'm glad you asked. How did he do those miracles? Walk on the water for crying out loud, feed 5,000, raise Lazarus and others from the dead. How did he do these healing people, right? Uh, leprosy, ra uh, uh, delivering people from demon possession. How if he set aside his deity, Pastor Bill? Thank you for asking. Did he do those things? Got an answer for you. He did it in the same way, the same option that you have, the power that's available to you. It's not your power. Where does it come from? Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. That's right. From the will of the Father, through the power of the Spirit, is how Jesus 
did it. But So he sat in the back seat the whole time, and the power that worked through him, the ones that steered it were the Father and the Holy Spirit, and yet his life looked like it was totally God's, didn't it? He was totally God. But he, we already know he set it aside. So again, how did he do it? He did it through the power of the Spirit. He stayed back there in the back seat. Unlike us, though, who were also in the back seat, he didn't try to drive from the back seat. When it says he set aside, he emptied himself. I mean, he really did. Look, look at his own words here. John 5, 19. Jesus answered and saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of him. That was never true in all eternity past. And that will never be true from the time he resurrected on into eternity future. But there was a 33-year time period in which that was 100% true. He became just like us, and he took our position, setting us an example, listen to me, of how we're to operate. How are we to operate just like Jesus? We should, we should, not do, we should do nothing of ourselves. Unless it is something we see the Father doing, which is exactly what Jesus did. He had his own prerogative, his own power, his own ability, right? He just set all that aside to set, an, among other things, to set example for us. Now, but let me tell you something. If Jesus had nothing to say from the back seat, what do you have to say from the back seat? Nothing. You have no input. I know he gave you a brain. You need to check it at the window getting into the back seat because the one in the driver's seat knows what's going on and you need to listen to him. You need to do what he says. You want to know what ministry is if we're accomplishing anything at Island Baptist Church? Is that's what we're doing right there. We're in the back seat keeping our mouth shut until he tells us. We're in the back seat doing nothing until he moves us. We're in the back seat not coming up with our own ideas. God willing. God deliver us from those ideas. Until he gives us those ideas. Is it good enough for Jesus? It ought to be really good enough for us. And it doesn't say that in just in one place. For I did not speak on my own initiative. What? What? The Son of God? If there's anyone that has an initiative, it's him. He set it aside, ladies and gentlemen. He set it aside. I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what I am to say and what to speak Oh, wow. You understand the submission of Christ? He submitted himself to a humble position, which, by the way, is the position you've always occupied. See, humility is not something that you already are humbled, and if, you're not, if your brain doesn't think, though, it's just because your brain's messed up. Like I said, if you think for some crazy reason that you're steering this thing, it's just your brain. It needs to be re reprogrammed. And that's what the Word of God's for. What to say, what to speak, that I know that His commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. He became like us. Again. Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing on my own initiative. What a terrible, terribly important Testimony that is to the church, isn't it? Nothing on his own initiative? Guaranteeing he's doing that now. But for 33 years, mm -mm. But I speak the things that the Father have taught me. Again, if I, do, if, I, if I do not do the works of the Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though I, you do not believe me, believe that we're not. It's not his own works. The Father's works, complete submission to the will of the Father and the power of the Spirit, sat in the back seat for 33 years, submitted himself completely. And by the way, it turned out perfect, didn't he? So I'm thinking you can go back there and do the same thing and do the same thing. So that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and that I am in the Father. He didn't say or do anything on his own prerogative or power. It was only what the Father willed and what the Spirit empowered. He went through something very trying and, and uh, amazing to me. Uh, John chapter, Luke chapter 4 illustrates it, where he was taken in the, filled by the Spirit, taken in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Forty days. What an incredible story that was. And so, so back up to what I just told you. So he set aside his prerogative as deity, his power, his knowledge, all these things. So how did he endure the test that was brought to him through this entity that we call the devil. 
What does it say? Full of the Holy Spirit. I don't know when the last time you read the Bible is, but it says there that Jesus, that God is willing to fill you with his spirit. So the same spirit that filled Jesus that enabled him to stand in the wilderness against such a foe as the enemy is the same spirit that's willing to fill you who think that you can't do certain things and can't stand against the devil. I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you that's not true. I'm here to tell you, have you ever wondered why during that temptation, he didn't just, I mean, the devil was after him. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread, right? If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, et cetera, et cetera. Why didn't he just reach over and pinch his head off? Because <laughs> I promise you that he had never spoke to deity that way, nor would he ever do it again. I promise you that. You find the devil in the Bible speaking to God, but he's never in that kind, that kind of way. For the first time, listen to me, ever in the existence of the Godhead, in Satan's existence, he found a member of the Godhead in a humbled position. So he took a shot. He lost, but he took a shot, didn't he? That's what's going on there. He became just like one of us, and he... He accessed the only thing that we have access to stand against the enemy, to stand in dark times, which is what? The will of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. It was not in a diminished form. He, he, took it on, he took it as much as we could as in human beings, as much as it available to us, it was available to him. And he walked right through it, unscathed. We already saw this, but that, that he even suffered on the cross. How did he suffer apart from his divine ability how could jesus hang on the cross we always say because he's god no he was god he is god but that's not how he made it. it tells us here he did it dependent upon another part of the godhead does it not then with will the will of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself how did he get through that we, we see we see his human nature as he sits in the garden saying saying let this cup pass from me right but again, because he's in the back, he says, but not my will, but your will. It ought to be the umbrella over every prayer you pray. That's a great human prayer. Since I'm human, God, here's the stuff I'm submitting to you nevertheless. Not as I will, but as you will. Because I'm in the back seat, and you're the one driving it. And I don't want to ever think for a second that anything is different other than that, that you're the one back there. I mean, I'm sorry, that I'm the one back there and that you're the one up front of the will of the Father and the power of the Spirit. And so we're giving his example, right? And in fact, it's very clear that we should follow it. For we have been called for this purpose. Since Christ who suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Step number one, you know we're close to the steering wheel. Step number two, stop thinking that you are. Step number three, quit trying to drive from back there. Make a difference. It'll make a huge difference. How do ministries make it? How do Christians become effective and flourish? They do it that way. No other way. I'm going to ask you if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we pray about the things that God has spoken to us today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus and for all that he did and what amazement how he set himself it just seems so counterintuitive. If I ever got power, I would never give it up. He had it all, and he laid it all aside, subjected himself completely to the experience of what it was to be human, including down to being tempted horribly by an entity that he himself had created. That's amazing. It's awe-inspiring but it's also teaching us that he subjected himself and he, he didn't use the prerogatives and powers of being God. He used what was available to us, a human nature, dependent upon the will of the Father and the power of the Spirit, and yet he walked a perfect life. He had all that he needed for that. Lord, I thank you for that teaching. I, I, I pray, Lord, as we see ourselves, that we would indeed see ourselves in that back seat. We'd be so comfortable there, seat belted in, trusting you, agreeing with every turn that you make, not putting up any uh, resistance, not pointing in another direction, uh, not creating havoc back there, but just simply resting in uh, the drivability of our Father and of his Son.
and of his spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this message, for this teaching, for uh, the, the example of the submission of Jesus and the calling that we have in this life to that same submission. Help us, God, through your spirit to accomplish it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.